Hi folks, it's Andy. Welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. Okay, so here we are for another week of fantastic questions. There aren't too many today, so should be a nice, short and sweet episode for you all. Uh, we'll jump into them in just a moment. But you know the usual things, right? Like, share, subscribe, you know all the uh, YouTube stuff. But most importantly, support the channel by shopping at kendostar.com. It's the best Kendo equipment website in the known universe. Now, of course, I would say that because I own the place. Say it every week. If it's your first time here, you should be shopping at Kendo Star. Everyone else already knows. I'm sure everyone in your dojo is already shopping there. We're the best place in the world. If you don't believe me for whatever reason, I don't know why you wouldn't believe me on the wrong channel if you don't believe me. But <laughs> you can check out our Trust Pilot rating. We're like super high rated. Look, the kit's good. You get great service. You get these videos. We've got more videos coming too. Did you watch the one I did yesterday about the uh, All Japan Women's Championships happening this Sunday? Looking forward to that. It's going to be a great tournament. Um, I did the review of the program yesterday. I've got more instructional content coming very soon. So yeah. Also, if you're in the UK uh, or want to travel to the UK in October, um, the last Saturday of October, I have a seminar, live seminar that you can come to. It's all about how to win Shi'ai. Now it's called How to Win Shi'ai and it is about how to win Shi'ai, but it's not just for people that only care about Shi'ai or anything like that. What it's about is about how to make your Kendo more reliable, how to achieve uh, Ucore Datotsu. That's what we're all trying to do, right? So it's not your standard run-of-the-mill seminar. We're not going to be doing kata. It's not about how to pass your grading. It's about how to achieve you call that otter in a variety of situations. So if you want to come to that, um, spaces are filling up fast. Uh, there's a link in the description uh, for you to sign up. That's the last weekend of October. It's just one day. Um, it's in the northwest of the UK in a place called Bolton. It's near Manchester. Easy to get to, easy to travel to. So sign yourself up before you miss your chance. It's the first one we're doing. <clears throat> we will be doing more though. Right, all the plugs done. <laughs> You're gonna have to put up with my hay fever allergies again. Let's get to these questions. Okay, first one. Uh, it says, "Good evening, Fisher Sensei. I have a question regarding the men strike etiquette. When launching uh, men strike, is it okay to hit the opponent's men with your kote uh, collaterally uh, if they don't move out of the way fast enough? Should my hands be lowered after striking men, or just carry on forward with the momentum?" Once again, many thanks for just such a great channel. Okay, that's a great question. So, what should you do after you hit uh, men? I need to make sure I'm going the right way when I'm moving myself here. If I go that way, I go off camera, right? Uh, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> when you strike men, if you hit with good tenuji, because there's flexion on the shinai and you're relaxed after striking, your hands are going to come up ever so slightly. They don't want to come up over your head like this is a bad uh, habit. After striking, you want to try and keep your hands in front. This way, men, this way. And as you drive forward, especially in Kihon, and Kihon, maybe you're going to go past. Keep your arms outstretched in front. Your opponent has to move out of the way. If they don't, yeah, they're going to get bumped by your kote. It doesn't mean you have to punch them or knock them over or something like that. But try to go straight. Try not to go off to the side to avoid them or something like that. All right? In uh, more realistic situations like Keiko or whatever, you're not going to drive past and show your back to them, right? So you're going to hit, you're going to go forward, you're going to bump into them because they're not going to move out of the way for you, right? <laughs> and then what you're going to do is you're going to change your direction, you're going to keep your eyes on them and you're still going to get your separation if necessary, all right? Watch my video about Zanshin. Um, it's a bit of an old one now, probably could do with redoing it, to be fair. Um, but go and watch that uh, for more info on it, okay? Uh, I hope that sort of answers the question. I have to keep trying not to go off the screen. <laughs> right, okay, next one. Hi, Andy, bit of a long teaching question, so apologies. Okay, this is a good one. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. It says, uh, 
thought I'd nobble you ahead of the seminar next month, okay? So he's talking about the seminar um, that I just talked about. It'd be good uh, to see some of you coming. Um, my sensei are encouraging me to give advice to lower grades more, including when visiting other dojo with them or helping them out at a seminar. I'm happy to do this, but I'm always unsure exactly where to start and cru crucially where to stop with advice. I know that when my sensei look at me, they see about 100 things wrong, but rather than tell me everything at once, they approach them in a kind of order. My sensei will often say, right, now that's improved, I can finally tell you that you are doing this wrong. Uh, is there some kind of a new universal logic to this order, like fix the footwork first, fix the grip first, come I first? Or is it very individual and you have to take each person as they come? Also, I'm always a bit torn as to what to show through our Kendall practice and what to tell, especially when practicing with people who may not be used to the show style of teaching. It's not uncommon I'll be trying to show someone something during Jigeko and think, right, this person is not getting it. I have to stop and explain. The question is, <clears throat> this all boils down to is, if you see 100 things wrong, how do you pick what to start with and when do you stop? And how do you balance say versus show, especially to people who are not in your dojo? Thanks. Okay, so that's a really great question, <clears throat> and it's a really difficult one because it really depends on your own dynamic, right, in your in the situation you're in. Obviously, like, for me now, for me now, in the UK, I'm considered a high grade, so whatever dojo I go to, wherever I go, people look to me for instruction, whether that's right or wrong. Um, in Japan, obviously, that's not the case, or in places where I'm not necessarily a high grade, I'm just normal, um, then obviously that doesn't happen. So it is a little bit of a, a dependent on that for a start. However, look, um, the first thing is when you see somebody that's obviously doing quite a few things wrong, um, there is, I wouldn't say there's a specific order. Obviously some things are more important than others. Like I correct someone's footwork before I corrected their, like, I don't know, like, uh, say it or something like that. Um, but... I think if you see a lot of things wrong with somebody, the best way to go about it is look at what's the most glaringly obvious thing. Um, and sometimes, sometimes that's the easiest way, at least whilst you're getting used to doing this. Sometimes it's not always the case. Sometimes it might be something that's less obvious that once it's fixed, it fixes a whole a load of other things too. Um, like one I often find, um, to give you a bit of a tip, is um, the position of the hips. Lots of people have their, their hips too far forward uh, and they're making that sort of S shape come I that I've talked about. And the hips are sat forward because people think about pushing forward with the hips, but they're not pushing forward with the hips from the lower body. Their hips are kind of underneath them. So the the come is in a sort of S shape. So when they jump forward, they can't really do proper kikentai no ichi. Um, and if you if you sort of fix that, it tends to fix like their fumikomi and some other stuff as well. Um but it's not always super easy to spot. So that's just one example. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would take it from whatever I'd see as probably the most glaringly obvious thing, starting with footwork. If the footwork is dodgy, then get started on that. Um, and I wouldn't tell them all 100 things at once. Um, one, maximum two, depends if there's two really bad things, and if, especially if they're linked to each other in some way. And you could go to two, but I'd probably try to stick to just one main thing um, rather than too many things all at once because uh, people aren't going to process it. You know what I mean? Like if you throw too much at them, they, they go, they'll forget. They'll forget. Um, they forget when you just tell them one half the time. So uh, that's that's the, that's why Kendall's hard. Um, in terms of uh, the show versus tell, now this is a really interesting one because it's a real difference between like the... Japanese way of learning kendo and the Western way. In, in the West, we very much like to explain, we like to talk, we like to ask questions, uh, this sort of thing. Um, whereas actually in Japan, that doesn't happen so much. You're, sh you're not even shown, you just, you know, well, you are, but you're left to your own devices to figure out what it is you've got to sort out. Now, obviously for kids and stuff, it's not quite like that. They are sort of explained to. But it's not the case that they're like, um, you know, everything's spoon fed to them. So there is a difficult balance to strike there. I'm, I think uh, you have to try and, you know, it, it depends on the um, the level of the person you're dealing with. Um, if you got people who are just starting out, sort of less, sort of let's say. 
first down, second down below. You know, you can try and show them all you want, probably not going to get it without you explaining what it is that you're trying to show them. Um, to be honest, uh, you're probably better off just giving them a bit of a hint as well. Or, or um, try to show them in Jigeko. You don't necessarily have to stop the Keiko. Um, just do the Keiko and then explain to them afterwards. Uh, it's probably an easier way rather than just stopping the Keiko to explain to them. Because... Uh, they, they won't they won't you know uh it won't sink in anyway in the middle of cake for most of them a lot of them the you know when the first the the it's not even just it depends it happens to me too like with the even with the let's say higher grade people who are sort of fourth down fifth down you know when they come up and do cake with me they get you know the blood's up they're all like oh, like this they're tense you know just try talking to them it ain't gonna sink in you know um so you're better off doing, you know, doing what you can do to show them. And then if you don't feel like they got it, just explain afterwards after the cake call. You know, oh, thanks for the cake call. By the way, I just was trying to, you know, I noticed this and that's why I was doing it this way or what, whatever. Um, it's difficult though, like you say, when you're doing it in a dojo, it's not your dojo. You've got to be a bit careful with that. You don't want to upset the, uh, the teachers there either. Can be, you don't want to tread on feet. Could be difficult. Good question though. Okay, next one. Uh, hello sensei, when is it appropriate to start practicing and assuming Sankakuku no Kamae? Okay, so uh, you wrote this one and I was like, what, what is that? Because <laughs> I did a Google of it and um, like a few different things came up. So we've clarified what you meant is this kind of Kamae. So it's like a, it's a different approach to the idea of Chudan um where um the shinai isn't directly straight uh and the the hips aren't directly straight either um the uh i think uh i think the definitely the shoulders aren't straight the shoulders shouldn't be straight anyway in chudan no kamaya it's a big myth that you should have your shoulders straight your hips should be straight but you should obviously your right shoulder has to be in front of the left shoulder because your arms are the same length and the right hand goes in front so if you have it the same length, then the same, sorry, if you have your shoulders square, then obviously you can't hold the shinai properly. Um, so look, this sort of thing, uh, when is it appropriate to start practicing and assuming it? Well, it's a difficult question to answer that. Um, I'm not sure if that time comes. Depends on you, really, but if you aren't sure, probably not yet. Um, I think this is the sort of thing I'm not, I, I've heard uh, senseis in Japan sort of talk about this type of kamai as well. Um, it's not, it doesn't work for me. I don't think because, uh, I don't think it lends itself to modern kendo very well. Um, where the, you know, we can so, sort of consider the pinnacle of, uh, of kendo to be sort of almost like Debano Waza almost, not necessarily Debano Waza, but that sort of feeling. Um, and I don't think that this sort of Kamai lends itself to that. It's a bit of a deep topic, but, uh, and yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd try it if you want, but I don't, I don't think you'll get any benefit from trying it. Um, I'm not sure I would benefit from trying it yet. Let's put it that way. Um, you could probably try it from fifth dan. Give it a try. You've got a bit of an idea, I guess, a, a bit more of what kendo is like. But I wouldn't go. Um, I wouldn't go sort of crazy into it. Um, to be honest, uh, so, so I mean, the people I've ever, sp the only people I've ever spoken to about this that have been like, yeah, this is how I like to do the kamai, have all been seventh dan or eighth dan. Let me put it that way. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, for me, it sort of falls into the category of kind of going off on your own a little bit. So just be a bit careful of that, to be honest. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's wrong. Let's just, before some of you out there hear what I didn't say. <laughs> I'm not saying it's like not allowed or something like that, because it is, right? I'm just not sure how super efficient it is or effective it is for um 
for lower grades and I consider lower grades being sick down and below <laughs> in this context. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right, next one. My sensei, Seventh Dan Kyoshi, uh, claimed he was able to score handmen on a very high profile sensei during a Shiite. He told me to look it up and gave me the year. He claims that not only uh, every match is listed on the internet, but also every score and method of the score. I'm curious if you know the place where this information is available. My limited skill in Japanese is not helping my search. Um, okay, so first off, uh, hanmen is like, he'll mean katate hanmen, so it's where you, it's like a bit of an old technique where you uh, let go with the right and you make a, a one-handed strike to the yoko men. Sort of like this, um, making the hand me come out, uh, hand me stance, like side on, this sort of way. Um, I scored it once too, actually, uh, <laughs> uh, back when I was sort of young and stupid. Um, the uh, it, it, it's it's not as relevant in uh, modern kendo. That's why I say when I was young and stupid, um, as it was sort of in the past, um, because the way it kendo's evolved, it doesn't. That's why you don't see it so much anymore. It's not as it's not as relevant. Um, so that you know, like sensei is from years ago. Yeah, they would have probably scored it a lot uh, as it was part of sort of the sta not standard, but it was part of the the sort of repertoire you would use um, because it was more relevant than it is now. Um, whereas I was just being an idiot. Uh, <laughs> um, in terms of uh, looking up the Shi'ai results, it depends on what tournament it is you're talking about. Um, it really depends. Uh, the, the There's not a record of every Shi'ai that ever happened, obviously. Um, but, you know, if it was a high-profile tournament, then um, absolutely it could, you know, um, th there could be a record of that, record of that somewhere. Um, but I, without knowing what tournament it was, I wouldn't be able to help you to where to look. Um but uh I've, you know this this sort of story of um uh scoring uh, scoring the handmen uh the katate handmen was uh, against a high profile uh kendoka from uh especially several years ago um it, it's not that uncommon i've heard it a few times from a few different senseis i think it was something that probably back in the day was quite a useful technique um because of the way that kendo was then but as I say, it, it it's evolved quite a lot, um, and uh, it's it's different to what it was uh, when when that sort of was. It was useful. Okay, here we are. The last question. Like I say, it was a short one today. Uh, Koden mold. Uh, question one: How do we prevent mold from occurring, especially in uh, humid tropical places? I understand that tea tree oil is a good solution. Is that right? Uh, question two: Mold eradication. If mold develops, does a one-to-one -one mixture of white vinegar and water do the job? Uh, should I be washing kote in, in water and soap instead? Uh, Google has suggestions, but I'd rather hear from a manufacturer like yourself, especially for my cherished KS Kamui bog. Thanks. Okay, so look, um, yeah, obviously Japan's a very hot and humid place. So I know exactly what it's like. The, uh, the thing to do is uh, basically... Um, after you've uh, practiced, after you finish practice, you get home, make sure you get your, your bug out of the bug bag straight away and put your kote somewhere where they're going to get um, as much air as possible. And if, if it's really humid and it, there's no wind or anything like that, then use a fan, like an electronic fan. Um, you just use a cheap one um, to, to sort of blow the wind on them. Uh, you can hang them and put the fan on it or something like that. Uh, and that'll definitely help them dry out faster. Um, and it'll it'll prevent mold uh, building up. Uh, if you do get, uh, I I don't I'm I've never heard of spray. I don't, look I don't spray my bog with any stuff. Um, I never have done when I lived in Japan too. Um, I don't think it's a great idea. It's probably not great for the materials, so I wouldn't recommend it. Um, in terms of your second question about using white vinegar and water, you don't need to do that. Um, just using water and soap. Uh, is the way to do it um, and I even wouldn't use much soap to be honest it, I'd try and avoid using soap if I could um, maybe even just water um, and uh, just gently wipe, wipe it away um, but the best the best thing to do of course is to try and avoid it by like I say uh, use a fan or something to keep try and keep them as dry as possible 
Um, you could also use those things like um, there's like uh, you know like you get the silica gel stuff sometimes in in packs of food, um, and you can buy ones that are like I think made of charcoal or something. I don't know, uh, but those sort of packs that kind of absorb the moisture as well. You could do something like that. Um, I definitely think that would help. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Quite a short episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, shop at Kendall Star, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.